Good evening. Good evening. Oh, no one ever does that. That's great. Um, I'm Deborah Wall. I'm the Deputy Archivist of the United States. Welcome to the National Archives, to those of you here in the McGowan Theater, and also to those of you joining on our YouTube channel. Tonight's panel discussion, Why the Bill of Rights Was Made, is the first public program related to our new exhibit, Amending America. This exhibit opens to the public tomorrow upstairs in our Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery, and it will run through September 4th, 2017. With the exhibit, we begin marking the Bill of Rights 225th anniversary with activities across the nation, including a traveling exhibit, educational outreach, and public programs like this one tonight. When I first heard of the exhibit, I was shocked to learn that there have been more than 11,000 proposed amendments to the Constitution, um, some narrow, narrowly missed ratification, some came nowhere close, um, and, but whether a long shot or a sure thing, the amendments or the proposed amendments demonstrate our government in action as prescribed by the Constitution. Before we move on to tonight's program, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming to this theater soon. Tomorrow at noon, Mary Sarah Builder will talk about her book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention, which shows how digital technologies and traditional textual analysis have revealed that James Madison revised his notes on the 1787 Constitutional Convention to a far greater extent than previously recognized. And on Tuesday, March 22nd, at noon, Nara Staffer and historian Mitch Yockelson will discuss his new book, 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the German Army in World War I. In it, he tells how General John Blackjack Pershing's exemplary leadership led to the unlikeliest of victories. And we're, we're proud of, of our colleague Mitch for, the, for this work. Uh, if you want to know more about upcoming events and all of our public programs, please consult our calendar of events. Copies are available in the library, I'm sorry, in the lobby, I guess the library, um, along with a sign-up sheet to be included on our, our mailing list, email, or regular mail. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is, become, is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. And if that's something you're interested in, we've got inf more information about that in the lobby as well, or you can go to archivesfoundation.org. Okay, on to tonight's presentation. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the Constitutional Sources Project. And it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator. John Molusky is the Director of Digital Programming and Executive Producer and Managing Editor of Wilson On Demand for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Previously, he served as executive producer, moderator, and managing editor of Close Up on C-SPAN. Please join me in welcoming John and the panel to the stage. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we, um, you, you've received information on your way in, so, and my guess also is that if you're here, you know who these panelists are, because that's part of the draw, correct? But let me tell you at least where they're sitting from your left to right. Over on the left is Jack Rakove. Jack is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian from Stanford University. Sitting next to Jack, just in case, we always like to have a backup Pulitzer Prize winner. So Joseph Ellis is also a Pulitzer Prize winner and historian from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Not really. The Rose Between Our Thorns, Mary Sarah Builder is a professor at Boston College Law School and author of Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention, and she'll be back here on this stage tomorrow to talk about her book. And Kenneth Bowling is co-editor of the George Washington University First Federal Congress Project. Please help me. Uh, you, let me tell you this, unlike delegates to the Constitutional Convention who are dying to get out of that overheated hall, you're going to be begging to stay once you start hearing from this panel. So please uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming them once again.
thanks. And also, I want to say hi, a uh, shout out to those of you joining us uh, via YouTube and also via C-SPAN. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, let me begin. We're going to try something here. If you have a tri-corner hat, this would be the time to bring it out. <laughs> We're going to do a little time travel. What I'm going to ask you to do is sort of take us back in time through the mists of time and, and paint a picture for us very briefly, and we'll go to each of you, of what the country was like at this moment. Before we start digging specifically into the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, if you could just help us get a feel for what this young country was like, what the atmosphere was like. You know, people always talk about how partisan this town is. Anything like that that could add some color or some texture or some context to what we're going to be talking about. And can we begin in the uh, 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 order of introduction with you, Joseph? Well, I, I, I suppose if, you, if each of us were to pick out one thing, we'd, we'd have to think about a favorite fact. So I'd say, OK, we want to situate the United States in the mid-1780s. Uh, so uh, independence, is independence from Great Britain has just been won. There's a somewhat fragile national government, which was often described as being imbecilic in nature. Uh, a number of new governments at the state level, which were struggling to deal with the burden of the public debt. Uh, there is a potentially explosive movement of population looking to go westward as um, soon as the war ends, and really even before Americans start uh, moving north across the Ohio River, uh, creating a great deal of mischief with uh, you know, the native peoples resident there. Um, there's a whole set of questions about the nature of American commerce with the old world, whether uh, farmers moving west across the Appalachians will be able to uh, sell their, you know, be able to send their produce downriver, down the Ohio, down the Mississippi River, out into the Gulf of Mexico and reach the, uh, the markets they want to reach in the West Indies uh, because the Spanish have closed the navigation of the Mississippi to, uh, uh, to American ships. So you know, I'd say on the eve of when the Constitution was written, um, there's, a, you know, there's a, you know, a number of very open-ended political questions about the nature of Republican government and you know, masking or uh, overriding whatever, uh, you know, a lot of ferment and uh, turmoil within society itself. Jack, thank you. Joseph. I move the needle a little bit further along, like 1789, which is at the moment when the Bill of Rights, so what we now call the Bill of Rights, was created. The Constitution has just been ratified, and no one is really clear about what it means. And that, unlike today, where we're crystal clear. Um, <laughs> and so there, we're in a transitional moment between. Um, the Confederation and the Constitution between a Confederation and an and a alleged nation. And um, I think the only thing that people can all agree on is that whatever else the American Revolution means, Washington is the symbol of it. That's it. Um, and that the value, the institutions we think of as permanent are just being created, that means the executive branch and the judicial branch as well. So that it's an in-between moment in American history of some significance and people living in that moment are usually confused, mm -hmm. like now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mary. Um. It's like hard to trail two Pulitzer Prize winners. You're like, what else could I say? Um, I guess I just add that it's a moment that looks very different than the one we live in today. So political power isn't held by someone like me. I mean, held by you guys. And uh, to my left and right. And um, it's a, um, women obviously don't participate. I think it's a country that's, um, that's beginning to struggle very explicitly with the question of slavery. The, States in the north, like Massachusetts and Vermont, are abolishing slavery. The southern states are moving um, to embrace slavery um, ever sort of stronger. And it's a moment where, where people are very aware that how they decide on that issue uh, really will tilt the fate of the nation. Well, I'm going to follow, Jeff, up, you're up. <clears throat> follow up on uh, something that uh, Joe said and say a few things about George Washington that I don't think people realize. Washington had a real vision of what the United States would be, become, and, and he tried to implement that to the best of his ability, uh, despite uh, a Congress that wouldn't put up with his ideas. Uh, he supported federal money for education, for the arts, for the sciences. 
I think by the time he was elected president, he'd already become an abolitionist, and he definitely believed in a multiracial society, uh, unlike many of the founders who believed in putting, sending the slaves, former slaves, back to Africa. Washington did not see that as a possibility, and he also wanted to embrace the Native Americans, the Indians, as part of American culture. Okay. Thank you. Now that we're, we're back in time, we'll dig into this notion of the Bill of Rights. And the first question I want to ask is about uh, why it didn't make the first cut. There were people who wanted it in there. Oh, you mean the, the, there were the three people who Yes, the, the Constitution itself. There were three people who refused to sign as a result, led by George Mason. Uh, why was it just that the delegates had had enough, they needed to get out of there, or they didn't think it was necessary? What are the, what are the main primary reasons that it didn't make the first cut? It's always impossible to explain why something did not happen. Um, it's like Sherlock Holmes, the dog that did not bark or something. Mm -hmm. um, they gave lots of reasons in the ratification process. Ham Madison said, well, we don't really need the Bill of Rights. This is not a monarchy. It's a republic. We don't face the same pressure to protect ourselves from tyrann tyranny in that regard. Also, the, the rights specified are enumerated rights. You don't need to worry about them. He also said, once you start listing rights, you might leave some out, and then you'll be sorry. Um, those are all arguments he made <clears throat> as a defender of the document that had passed. Um, as we are going to see, he's going to change his mind fairly quickly. But that Jack knows more about this than I do, but I go with they were tired and they wanted to go home. <laughs> I think that works up to a point, but uh, there's a deeper set of explanations, which is we can't think anachronistically about what a Bill of Rights was supposed to do unless we realize that the very idea of the functions a Bill of Rights was meant to fulfill was itself evolving. You go back to 1776 when Americans start writing constitutions at the state level, uh, eight of those constitutions had Bills of Rights attached to them. But you have to use the word attached somewhat carefully. In only two cases were bills of rights, in Mass first in Pennsylvania in 1776 and then Massachusetts in 1780, were bills of rights actually incorporated in the body of the text of the Constitution. In the other states, they're thought of primarily as a set of principles, in effect as a set of guidelines that both officials in government and perhaps citizens out of doors should respect and try to adhere to. But they weren't fully regarded as legally enforceable commands. They would not yet have been understood in the way that we now understand the Bill of Rights operating today, or let's say the first eight amendments reinforced by section one of the 14th Amendment. So a big part of the story, I think, really pivots on the idea that uh, one has to understand that, A, the nature of a written constitution, what does it mean to have a written constitution as supreme law? That's a dynamic concept, something that was not fully articulated in 1776. And B, the role that a Bill of Rights would play in some process of constitutional formation, that also had to be worked out as well. So I mean, so the way I would characterize this is, I think in 1776, uh, primarily, not, you know, some people go further, but primarily the idea of having a Bill of Rights was understood as a kind of statement of general principles that should accompany a transition between regimes, from a colonial regime to a Republican regime. The idea, though, that the, what we think of naturally, if it's incorporating the Bill of Rights, we have some basis to litigate. And there's a whole array of institutions out there, public interest law groups and so on, which would be happy to carry our cause forward. That idea was not available, or certainly not available in its full-blown modern form at the time these things were adopted. So then when the question arose in the convention towards the very end, and you know, Mason and Elbridge Gary, you know, both of whom were kind of mavericks, you know, they are kind of oddball politicians in, in, in different respects. Um, you know, they, they suggested, and there's, you know, and Mary may have thought more about exactly how much conversation was spent discussing it, but however much there was, there wasn't that much because many of the, you know, I think many of the framers would have felt this is a kind of, you know, ancillary, really unnecessary function. We don't need to do it. Now, Mason says we could do this in a, in a couple of hours of right. a fairly short period. I think Mason's idea is we'll just copy the Virginia Declaration yeah. of Rights. Yeah, so I'll, you know, you know. happen to have one here. So, we you know, I happen to have one with yeah. me, you know, so. 
So what you're describing, there, there was no hostility. It was just more, eh, we but don't I, need it. I actually think there's a, a piece that we, we so imagine the Bill of Rights, like it's been said, the way we understand it in the 20th century. And if you look at the Constitution itself and you think about what were the classic rights that appear in things like the English Bills of Rights, um, a lot of them are in the main Constitution. So we forget this. But they're not the ones we ever talk about. Well, that's because we take them for granted. So habeas corpus is in the Constitution itself. Um, the right that um, uh, to a criminal trial in a jury case is in the Constitution itself. Bills of attainder, ex post facto clause, um, no titles of nobility. And then the fact that you could take office without a religious test, which is incredibly important at a time when that exists in most um, states. And the Constitution. Um, has all of those in the main document. Those were the great, I mean, this has been the year of um, the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. So many of us have been on the Magna Carta circuit, which has been interesting, sure. um, talking about Magna Carta. And, and if you think about that tradition and what, what was so important to people at the revolution um, that mattered, a lot of them were things like right to representation, the legislature can't be prorogued. I don't even know how you pronounce that word. Um, you know, so so in some ways the Constitution is more robust with respect to rights than than we may see from our perspective. Mm -hmm. I you think that the way they should have seen it, and they didn't see it at, in September of 1787, uh, and they Madison will come to see this a, a bit gradually, but that the ratification process makes clear that. Failing to add a Bill of Rights was perhaps the biggest mistake they made. Because and what's the measure of that? How public because opinion of the or? debate in the once the ratification process starts and the debates begin in twelve of the thirteen college states, the recommendations they make for amendments, the vast majority of them would have been answered if in fact a Bill of Rights had been added. And, and it would have, if it had been added, it would have probably been inserted into the text of the document, not as an, a codicil. But that the, they should have seen this. They didn't. I think they were tired. They wanted to go home, as I said, because the way in which a Bill of Rights was perceived within the ratifying conventions was this is a document which declares a zone where the government cannot do things. And given the the fear of consolidated government at the national level, which is the central fear of the anti-federalist position, um, the Bill of Rights ameliorates that. Or it, it said, if you had a Bill of Rights, it says, no, no, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that. And that's the political context in 1789. So is this when this federalist, anti-federalist divide becomes cl clarified during the ratification process? Um, if you try to read all of the state debates, I thought you clarified is not the term that I would use. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's just so complicated. Yeah. Every state's different, and uh, every, within states, the different sections are different. Um, the most important fact about that, as I read it, is that there is no, they cannot have a national conversation. The only people that can have a national conversation are the people who contribute to the Federalist Papers. But the, the vast majority of the people in the state ratifying conventions are talking about things ex from a state or a local point of view. Um, they cannot think nationally. So that what we, we haven't created a nation, we've created the framework for a national government with it that will serve as an incubator for an emerging nation over the next 20 or 30 years. So who are the main voices that emerge on both sides of this equation, those who think we need to get back to work and create this Bill of Rights or these amendments, and those who think it's fine as is? Who are, who are the main voices that emerge? Well, I think <coughs> Madison, obviously. Yeah, yeah. We don't need a Bill of Rights. The state's constitutions have Bill of Rights. We can't specify everything, so it's dangerous to specify anything. And then the argument that uh, the federal constitution really can't touch the individual. Only the states can touch the individual. Uh, <clears throat> so Madison on one side with Hamilton, 
uh, and the Federalists in general, who didn't want to admit that there was anything wrong with the Constitution at all, although Hamilton did admit that uh, denying the residents of Washington, D.C. the right to vote uh, was a mistake and tried to get New York to propose an amendment to change the Constitution regarding that. Um, <clears throat> George Mason, on the other side, the man who, in effect, gave us the Ninth Amendment, who said to the Federalists, don't give me this nonsense about uh, just because we're listing some rights doesn't mean we have no more. Mm -hmm. We're only listing the ones that are historically, we fought for historically since 1215 or, or whenever uh, in the, in the Anglo-American world. Uh, you just have an amendment that says the Ninth Amendment. Just because we list certain rights doesn't mean we don't retain all the other rights. For instance, the right to bear arms is a Ninth Amendment right. It's not a Second Amendment right. Um, so I would postulate uh, my friend Madison and my friend Mason, Maverick though he might be, uh, as the two main players in this. And some people even try to credit and say that Mason is the father of the Bill of Rights. But well, I'd be, you know, I think I would tell a slightly different story. So I, I think the real point of emphasis that does help to actually create something of a kind of national perspective. I mean, Joe is right to say that, you know, it's, it'd be a mistake to exaggerate the extent of having a national audience in an 18th century culture, but there is a dramatic moment that takes place within a few weeks of the adjournment of the Constitutional Convention, which does help to focus attention on this question. It happens on October 6th, 77, when James Wilson, you know, a rather arrogant Scottish immigrant who had, you know, settled in Pennsylvania and made a successful career as a lawyer and politician gives a public speech. Wilson was the leader of the Pennsylvania Federalists and he was a known member of the, you know, the Pennsylvania delegation to the Federal Convention. And Wilson begins with the, you know, makes a kind of classic statement of the argument that if we start, um, if we start uh, identifying particular rights, the implication of that very process of identification will be that we've actually granted the national government powers that in fact we haven't granted it. So that if, for example, you want to have a freedom of religion amendment, uh, you know, the equivalent of the free exercise clause or the, you know, the establishment clause, um, from Wilson's way of thinking, which has a certain genius to it, but is politically quite problematic, uh, the idea of identifying a right might be taken to uh, imply that, you're, that a power has also been granted. And the fact that he does, well, so A, he does this in public, and then B, the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention, it's not the first convention to meet, but it's one of the very first, it's really the first one to have any kind of newspaper coverage, which is distinctly slanted in lots of ways towards the Federalist perspective. But Wilson makes similar arguments that the press does start to pick up on in uh, October, November of 1787. And so, so Wilson kind of gets the Federalist out there in a way that's, you know, I think he over-argues the point. There's a kind of theoretical validity to what he's saying, but for a variety of reasons, it's not the most persuasive argument, particularly to culture, which is rights-oriented and very sensitive about subjecting liberty. So that, that creates a kind of focus. Which I, so I think, in some ways, I think I disagree with Joe. So this I, is the that, Alexander there's, there's Hamilton framing. Federalist 84, was it 84? The, well, the, 84 where, comes he, really late. What he brings up that this yeah. could be dangerous. Is that what you're, Wilson's suggesting? This is a, a danger? Of yeah, the, the danger is that if you identify rights you want to protect, you might be implying the existence of powers that have not been delegated. So that's becomes yeah. kind of a tenth, it's a proto-tenth amendment, not ninth, it's a yeah. proto-tenth amendment kind of argument in that sense. By the way, I think or, if, we, if we bring up anything that Alexander Hamilton wrote or said, we have to do it in rap or hip hop yeah. <laughs> in honor of the, the current Broadway show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's Mary has said No, I was gonna say, I mean, I think this point's incredibly important because one of the sort of great ironies of the fight over ratification is that for the opponents of the Constitution, and I very much agree with the late Pauline Mayer that using the term anti-federalist is not necessarily useful, but for the people who opposed it, in, in trying to explain over and over again all the things they were anxious about, they made clear how um, robust and elastic the Constitution actually was. That is part of the reason that the Constitution ends up being read, I think, um, in, in, such a, in such a sort of, um, Un, sort of enfolding way is that in this enormous moment in a lot of states where people debated things, 
the people who were trying to sink it kept, try, kept explaining all the different ways that the government might have power. And ironically, that sort of stuck. You know, then they add the amendments. But there is this way that I think this debate is incredibly important in creating some of the rhetorics that we use today about how we interpret the Constitution. Well, speaking of that, the, the, you know, right now, when you talk about amending the Constitution, there's almost a, a religious fervor in opposition to it, that it's a sacred document that can't be touched. What, what was the attitude toward the notion of amending right after the ink was uh, dry? The initial reaction in the House when Madison, by the way, the, the original answer to your question is who's the star of the story? Madison's the star of this story, okay? The, to argue that Madison is the father of the Constitution is, could be controversial, could be argued about. Madison is the father of the Bill of Rights. He single-handedly wrote, he's the one who decided we needed one, he wrote it himself, the, the, and the, the eventual um, document sent out to the states is a reshuffling of the cards he gave them. Um, so it's really a Madison story. Um, and the question, and he's the one who concludes on the basis of the debates that have occurred in the ratification conventions that we, and this is a speech he gives on June something before the House when he presents the Bill of Rights to them. You know, like, you know, thank you. That, um, that um, we, we should realize there are a lot of people that have concerns about this document and are, and are good patriots and that we need to reassure them that rights that they take seriously have not been violated. And that for that very reason, I intend to submit to you, I do submit to you these, he calls it, he makes them nine amendments. Um, um, and what's interesting is when Madison is writing these in the spring of 1789, what he's got in front of him is the roughly 100 to 125 recommended amendments that the various state constitutions had made. Six states had made them. And, um, and so he's clearly attempting to respond to the criticism from the states. That's what this is. I'm listening to you. On the other hand, all the states that recommended amendments made recommendations that federal requests for taxation can be, in some sense, voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> You don't really have to pay. Now, there'll be different ways we can negotiate this. He simply deep six that. We're not going to bring that sucker up, OK? Um, he put one in that wasn't in there, namely, no state shall pass law violating freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, or freedom of jury, trial by jury, and, um, which is his attempt to sneak in the notion that the federal government really does have authority over these matters. And in some sense, it's, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't get to this position until the 20th century. Um, uh, but that what he's doing, and, and one of the members of Congress, how do you say his name? Adenius? Adenius. Adenius Burke from South Carolina says, and he must have been having a kind of metaphoric epiphany on this particular day. He says, there's a whirly blurb, uh, uh, there's a dessert, it's a frothy dessert called the whirly blurb or something. And he also says that the, he calls the, what Madison's proposing whirly blurb. Also, it's a tub thrown out to the whale. <laughs> Meaning, Madison is appeasing the states who are, uh, are the, the, those people who are reluctant ratifiers. Mm -hmm. But he's doing them a minimum. That is, he's giving them the minimum amount of what, what he can. And that is exactly what he is doing. Um, Ken, he's he's got, providing you, you them with, oh, with, with some assurance, but with not with the level of assurance that the most mm, reluctant ratifiers. Um, so Madison's uh, directly addressing public confidence in the document. Well, he's also addressing his own election. I mean, I think you have to step <laughs> yeah, back. And, well, that too. You know, he's, I mean, it's really quite incredible because he, he tries, he runs for the Senate, he loses. Um, he then claimed he didn't really want it after all. But then he runs for the House, and they've redistricted. Well, he's blocked by Patrick Henry. Right, right. Yeah. He's redistricted. They redistricted, hoping, hoping Monroe. And, and as part of that campaign, um, the standard story says that he decides he has to say he's for all essential rights. And, and, and I don't know how you feel. I think he honestly had changed his position. I don't think it's just a fake campaign mm -hmm. position. Um, Jefferson had written him arguing that there were advantages to rights, and there were advantages to moving. And I think Madison 
for him, it's both a, a you know, the House, you have to, he has to run for re-election two years later. And, and what so, did Jefferson say? It shouldn't be left to inference or something? Well, right. Jefferson says, you know, Madison has all the classic Federalist arguments, and Jefferson has some, some pretty decent ones. He says it'll be a useful tool for the judiciary. That's one that Madison uh, then absorbs. He says the famous uh, half a loaf is better than none. Right. Um, you know, Jefferson sort of says, and it's interesting because Jefferson's usually the big theory guy, and Madison's usually the pragmatist, and on this Madison is, is the sort of theory guy. Here's all the reasons we don't need one. And Jefferson's like, look, here's some pragmatic ones. And then I think Madison, very importantly, comes to the conclusion that the people will believe in rights. And, and even if it doesn't work at the governmental level, that if you have a Bill of Rights, if you have rights somehow, the people will come to believe them. And then, in essence, as a working out principle in the system, they'll somehow be important. And that's a thing that he cares a lot about. Ken, uh, yeah, Joseph in, 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 uh, invoked the tub in the whale uh, uh, phrase, and you wrote a noteworthy article using that. Oh, that's uh, right. You did. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a John, it's a Jonathan Swift phrase. Uh, see, he, Swift wrote, seamen have a custom when a whale approaches the ship to toss it a little tub, and the whale will amuse itself with the tub and the ship the ship of state can sail away safely. So what happened here was the states that proposed amendments to the Constitution, uh, over 400 were proposed. And uh, some of them uh, were not formally proposed because the major Federalist majority refused, like in Maryland and Pennsylvania, to accept them. But there were 400 proposed, about 100 ideas, 70 a percent of which or more were structural amendments that Joe was talking about, two-term president, et cetera. A minority of them were what we call civil, civil rights, civil liberties amendments, uh, <clears throat> about 30%. And when Madison drafted these amendments that he proposed to the first federal Congress, he basically ignored almost all of the structural amendments. They're going to come up in the debate because the anti-federalists in the House are going to bring them up. The, de the debate in the first Congress is not about the content of these amendments. Uh, I remember when Leonard Levy, the historian, used to send his graduate students to my office. Each one was supposed to find out what the first Congress said about each of those <laughs> Ten amendments, and they said nothing. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the debate was all about where to, where to put them, in, weave them into the Constitution, put them at the end, uh, or whether we need them at all. And uh, the tub to the whale, which many many members of the first Congress used as an example, uh, that's exactly what Madison's strategy was: don't harm the Constitution, just put things there that uh, will get it, will convince the opposition, the anti-federalists, in public that this is a good doc, that the Constitution is good. It, he wanted to win over the anti-federalists following. He knew that there was no hope of winning over the leadership like Patrick Henry. Mm -hmm. And I would add that we were very unfair to Elbridge Gary to use the term gerrymander oh, yeah. when <laughs> Patrick <laughs> Henry, <laughs> Henry mandered yeah, Madison's right. district for the first <laughs> federal Congress. That but doesn't the, sound as pithy. The right. most yeah, one, important. one of the things that is implicit in what you're saying is there, Madison is very afraid, overly afraid, many of the congressmen thought, of the Second Amendment movement, or excuse me, a Second Convention movement, yes. that both Patrick Henry in Virginia and George Clinton in New York, most especially the Clintonites in New York, were threatening to petition the states and call a Second Convention to listen to the recommended amendments, which was really a recipe for undoing the Constitution, okay? Now, Jay up in New York and even Hamilton was telling Madison, don't worry about this, you're overly concerned about it. But for him, this was, he, he was worried about it, and this threatened the Constitution. And so part of his motives in writing the bill, what becomes the Bill of Rights is to, is to kill the idea of a second convention by undermining their, the, 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 what they're standing on. He is saying quite explicitly, and this is a famous quote to you, he doesn't really believe in bills of rights. He doesn't believe that bills of rights serve much of a purpose. Jack's written about this at some length. And, uh, 
and his experience in Virginia is what he's based on. He doesn't believe that the Bill of Rights is going to do what everybody in 20th and 21st century America now regard as the essence of the Bill of Rights. I think that you can't, I don't want to give Jefferson too much credit because I think most, no, I never, of, I most of those letters, <laughs> most of those letters Madison got after he introduced the Bill of Rights, the so-called Bill of Rights. Uh, but the one thing in that letter, in Jefferson's letter, that's so important, and you mentioned it, Jefferson said, just wait until it gets, they get into the hands of the judiciary. And it took until the 20th century. <laughs> but I would like to comment very briefly on actually how radical these proposals were. Madison included stuff that he got from the state conventions, but he also put in his own language. The amendments that he proposed included the right to safety, the right of revolution, and the individual right to bear arms, which, of course, many of the states had also proposed. And the, the committee took, just tossed out completely the preamble that he wrote about safety and the right of revolution. And they you know what they did to the so-called the Second Amendment with his individual right to bear arms. They rewrote it. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the point was, you know, people have taken guns and closed down courts in Massachusetts in just in the last year and a half. Uh, we've got to put the brakes on this. So all the radical aspects of those amendments that Madison proposed, I think, were pretty much stripped out. I, I mean, the Second Amendment's become very controversial in the 21st century. Um, I have a different reading on this than you do. I think the Second Amendment was a response to four states that were requesting a guarantee against a standing army. And that the language of the Second Amendment, as he wrote it, was, begins with the assumption that, that defense will be in the hands of a militia. Not as he wrote it. Yes, it, well, yes, yeah. It, it is as no. he wrote it. It, it is, yes, it is. As he wrote it, it was the absolute individual right to be No, armed. no. That, that, that's no, absolutely wrong. That's wrong, really? Jack, no, yeah. you're wrong on this. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that, in that in my and Jack, I think's view, the right to bear arms is a derivative right deriving from service in the militia not a natural right that now n there's nobody worried about having your right to bear arms uh, denied because nobody's it's you know it's not something that's happened to anybody um, so that in my view the Heller decision of 2008 is about as unconstitutional as any decision I've ever seen and absolutely preposterous Jack did you want to weigh in yeah on this? so uh, <laughs> of, of, of all the things I've done in a career that's getting up near 50 you know 45 years or whatever there's there's nothing I'm prouder of having done than having written a brief uh, in D.C. versus Heller. There was a historian's brief of which I'm, you know, I'm the, to be honest, it's a bit on the Hispanic side, I'm the principal author of that brief. And it's just, you know, to echo what Joe was saying, um, there, again, I, you're just dead wrong on this. Ma Madison's, Madison's original language is about the militia. There's a very limited discussion, an extremely limited discussion of an individual right to bear arms, it's usually tied to the so-called descent of the Pennsylvania minority and you know, the, the Murray delegates in the Pennsylvania Anti-Federalist Convention. There's a little bit of noise from New Hampshire on this point, but the overwhelming bulk of the conversation, discussion, on the right to bear arms in 1787, 1788, 1789 was exclusively tied to the militia question. And the key thing here comes, emanates from an anti whether we should call them anti federalists or not, I don't care about the name, but it emanates from you know, the idea that because Congress in Article I, Section 8, Clause 16, has the authority to, uh, you know, to kind of override the states in terms of organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, some you know, zealous anti federalists and also some Southerners who worry about the future of the militia in terms of slave rebellion stake out the position that, you know, it may be that the militia is an essential institution of self-defense is going to be, you know, somehow eroded or we're going to be deprived of its benefits. The key point here is Justice Scalia, who, if you read through his opinion, I'm, I hope he's going on to, you know, a place of fitting rest, you know, <laughs> where, wherever it may be. But Scalia's abuse of historical evidence in the majority opinion uh, in D.C. versus Heller is so scandalous. Yeah. It's so disgraceful. 
It's so meanly worded, like so many of his opinions, that nobody should take that seriously. And the fact that Justice Breyer, the McDonald case, which is the incorporation case, a couple years later said, I think correctly, the historical record needs to be reconsidered. Scalia was dead wrong about this matter. But the idea that there, you know, I mean, it's perfectly fine to say, as individuals, we have a right of, a common law right of self-defense, subject to the police power regulation of local and, you know, local and provincial governments. Oh, I'm sorry. Did but you just, yeah, but, yeah, but the idea that, the, the idea of personal self-defense was entrenched in the Constitution through the Second Amendment is deeply problematic. But, and this is a big, this is a, a major qualification, when you get to the 14th Amendment, and when, which is written in the context of Reconstruction, the question of whether there should be an individual right of self-defense at that point looks much more legitimate. Why? Because African Americans are being slaughtered uh, in large numbers in various parts of the, you know, of the still unre un unreconstructed South. So there's, uh, so it, it's, you know, like most, like you know, historians like to say, the story's more complicated. Some aspects are not so complicated. So, I mean, some, at this point, I, I really am an absolutist. And you can take it or leave it, you know, but, but I think if you think about it historically, to think about the difference between the late 18th and the 19th century understanding tells us a great deal about how America is becoming more and more of a gun culture in which the individual right to pack, you know, carry a piece over time can become more important. Mary, I want to ask you more, uh, another question about Madison as author and editor, because you, you've made the point that he was looking at all of these other amendments that the states had proposed. So he whittles it down to, is it 19 for the final proposal? It goes to the Congress. Is it nineteen? It's nine. Months? They unpack it. To and then the House 17. cut it to seventeen. Yeah, you, they unpack it to seventeen. And then I think the Senate to twelve. Yeah. And then two. Then two are dropped at it. the ratification process. One comes back two hundred years later, right? One That's of, right. Right. Those two. So, so talk to us about this process of Madison. Of who had his ear? Was he doing this in isolation? Was this? A, were there people influencing what an initial amendments made the cut? What was the process? Well, I just, I think to pick up on this discussion, I think one really interesting thing is that the way we think about the rights have so much to do with the fact that the original first and second right fall out. So if you, if you think about, you know, put Madison aside, well, Madison wanted them incorporated into the Constitution. So sure. Madison wanted them interwoven. And um, he was thinking of revising the Constitution, amending the Constitution internally. I think this is an incredibly important thing because our notion of the Constitution, when we think of the Constitution, is that crinkly document that was written in 1787. But in some ways, Madison was thinking of amending the Constitution so in, in a much more active way. And Madison wanted, he actually, when he gave his great speech on June 8th, he had all of his, he explained where they were all going to go. And some of them were going to go in Article 1, Section 9, and some of them were going to go into Article 1, Section 10. And, it, and it, I think in all sorts of ways, it would have made the 1787 convention moment much less important because you couldn't have you couldn't have seen there would have been no moment any longer where the document looked like what it but, looked but, like. But it was a problem because they had signed a document right. that was no longer going to be the document that was the official constitution. Right. So Roger Sherman stands up and right. says and says this is a terrible idea because the constitution ought to be sacred. And, and it's really in that moment in 1789 that you begin to get this notion that something particularly special happened that summer um, mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. But even, so, so there's an enormous contingency in our understanding of the Constitution just based on that decision. And then there's enormous contingency in the fact that they sent 12 amendments out. Our First Amendment is Amendment Number 3. I mean, I don't know if the First Amendment would be as important if it was the Third Amendment. It doesn't sound so good, like, I have a Third Amendment right. I just, just doesn't quite have the same pizzazz. <laughs> You know, people are like, oh, it's the First Amendment, it must be the most important because it was the first. That, that's just completely historical contingency that the first two amendments, which are probably the first two because Madison in his original list, they were supposed to go into Article I, um, they fall out. They never get sufficient numbers of adoptions. And so the First Amendment becomes the First Amendment by you know, complete random chance. In fact, I think there were only, I looked this up recently, I think Kentucky... Um, uh, voted for the don't, you know, for the amendment, one of those first two amendments. But then by that point, Kentucky had actually added itself to the list. So you needed another state. So they sort of were perpetually one state short. 
But you could have easily had, you know, the first, we would have had the Bill of Rights, it would have had 11, and it wouldn't have looked like the Bill of Rights because one of the first two amendments would have dealt with Congress. And so, so it looks... It would have, we would have gotten used to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, people weren't paying that much attention to the Bill of Rights, right. really. Nobody paid I mean, attention to it. I the 20th century. And, um, and I, so, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that is implicit in what you're saying and all of us are saying is, you know, to think of the Bill of Rights as America's Magna Carta is really a 20th century idea. Yeah. Um, by the way, as long as you look at the Magna Carta, once you start looking at the Magna Carta, the Magna Carta is really not the Magna Carta either, okay? <laughs> um, so that this notion that there's this codification of semi-sacred rights and principles that are created in this one moment that seems to, you know, tongues to fire appear over their heads and they have, you know, <laughs> the gleaming uh, glances at the eternal. No, that never happens. And that's not what happened in 1789 either. Madison was making a deal to ensure the ratification process would com be completed successfully. By the way, North Carolina and Rhode Island still hadn't ratified when this is all going on. Um, and, um, so that, and, and then Jefferson, who I normally don't make strong arguments in favor of, um, <laughs> um, Jefferson cared much more about the Bill of Rights than he did about the Constitution. He thought constitutions come and go every 20 years. The Bill of Rights, because Jefferson cared a lot more about what government could not do than what government could do. And he tended to think platonically. And the notion that he and Madison are going to be the, probably the premier political team in the first 50 years of American history, um, they really thought differently. I mean, they are absolute opposites in the way they think about, about, uh, about in this particular case, the Bill of Rights. The, the overarching theme of amending the Constitution, and uh, I want to get back to that question I asked about, at what point, and you have began to touch on this, uh, at what point does this become this almost sacred document, that sort of the original intent arguments about this can't be touched, that there's danger in that, versus a work in progress? As you described, Jefferson thought we'd write it, rewrite it every 20 years. Is there a point in history that you can identify, or is it just a more gradual change? When do we really start to hit this point where we seem to be, at least much of many of us today, where it's just... I mean, I'm not sure you can say a point. I mean, there's not a magic moment when the idea of amending is, oh, yeah. is written off the table, and I'm sure congressmen continue to propose numerous amendments often. Now, there's, there's a real interest in reforming the Electoral College, for example, in the mid-1820s. Uh, but, you know, like a lot of things, that goes nowhere. I, I think the key part of this argument, there's a wonderful book about the 13th Amendment by Michael Vorenberg called mm -hmm. Final Freedom, um, mm -hmm. which is actually uh, the real basis for the Lincoln yeah. movie. I mean, it's nothing that Doris Kearns Goodwin provided. It was, you know, as the academic adv advisor, it was really Mike, Michael Vorenberg's book that provided the substance of what goes on in the movie. So Vorenberg's basic argument is that certainly by the time we get the 1840s, 1850s, the idea of amending the Constitution has become a very problematic idea because the you know the framers and the founders have acquired this uh, you know this you know this this great order around them. And so the curious set of political circumstances that make constitutional amendment it wasn't clear ab initio it wasn't clear at the beginning that the best way to get rid of slavery was via constitutional amendment. There's a kind of complicated political story about how that happened, but the consequence of that story was to revive the idea that the amendment process itself was something that Americans could go back to using. And of course, out of this comes the 14th and the 15th Amendments and the whole idea that you know, many legal scholars now endorsed, which is worth arguing about whether or not Reconstruction constituted a second founding or a kind of you know, quasi-second founding. Uh, a lot of that does pivot on the whole idea of the, you know, the, the Constitution can be amended and amended for radical purposes. So speaking of uh, uh, the Constitution as quasi-religious document, I want to ask you, because I know you're working on a book on the establishment of religion, is that correct? A free exercise. Okay, yeah, free exercise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we haven't talked about the religion yet as part of the, yeah. the, the Bill of Rights. What can you tell well, us Well, actually, you know, I'd like to come back and, and pick up on something that, uh, that Joe said earlier. Um, I think Joe you know, repeats that. What I think is a fairly uh, you know, common perception among Americans. What is it? that rights do, and the idea is rights exempt us from the authority of government. Um, I, you know, with all respect to Joe, I would actually disagree with that. Most rights do not exempt us from the authority of government. Most of the rights we possess in the first eight amendments to the Constitution 
Uh, and we'll leave the second out of this, because uh, I've said enough about that one already. Uh, maybe even too much. Well, see, it sets up, you know, most rights actually set up standards the government has to conform to when it deals with us. Uh, you, know, reasonable, you know, unreasonable search and seizure. So what's reasonable search and seizure? You know, what, you know, what, is, it, what is due compensation for, you know, the exercise of eminent domain or whatever. That's what, in my way of thinking, because I am writing a book on this, that's what makes the religion clause, particularly the free exercise clause, so exceptional, because the free exercise clause says, in, in, in language that was historically radical in the 18th century, that here is a realm of behavior where the individual is sovereign. Here is a realm where government will no longer act at all. What you believe is a matter of conscience, that's, and it relates uh, to men and women alike, male and female, he created them both. So it does it actually, it, you know, it does, it does span the gender gap. So I think in that sense, as, as boy, the book of my argument is, is, is say the title of the book is Beyond Belief, Beyond Conscience, The Radical Significance of the Free Exercise of Religion. And this, the point I'm trying to make here is that of all the rights we possess, the one that places the greatest emphasis on our individual moral autonomy is freedom of conscience. I agree with that. You know, and, yeah. uh, you know other rights... You know, or, you know, they they certainly create you know penumbras formed by emanations that give us notions of privacy and you know all the other language. But other rights presuppose the government's going to act. When it acts, it has to conform to some set of fixed standards that will be respectful of liberty, due process, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's a that you know maybe I'm pushing this too far, but there is a kind of significant qualitative difference there. That's, it, can I just, a, a point of I order, just, just a second. I, I just want to alert you now that in a moment we'll come to your questions. And uh, so there are microphones positioned at both staircases. Be careful as you make your way there. Uh, if you'd like to begin lining up now, we'll come to your questions in just a moment. But um, go ahead, Mary. What no, I was just going to say not to go back to the Second Amendment, but it's interesting when you read the, <laughs> when you read the, um, the first Congress and everyone discussing things about that, the issue that we care about, they don't care about, and the issue they're obsessed with is what to do about Quakers. Who won't? Who by by means of religious conscience, this exact point, um, can't won't bear arms, won't join the militia, and this is the issue that you know you page after page they're worrying about. And Madison's original draft um, in his June eighth speech that the clauses that sort of form what becomes the Second Amendment has this explicit language about those who are religiously scrupulous uh, right. of bearing arms don't have to. And so it's a very Which interesting Which underlines fact. Jack and Mai's point yeah. that that's the real concern. It has to do with serving in the militia, not as a natural right. Okay. And the, cur the curious thing about the Quaker exemption is it's, it's tied to what becomes the Second Amendment and not the First Amendment. It's regarded not as, you know, because we have, there's a lot, as I'm sure many of you know, it's an enormous amount of discussion in the current jurisprudence and religion clause about what kinds of exemptions do we have against the regulatory authority of the state? Uh, but in the 18th century context, the exemption for the Quakers would not have been perceived as a First Amendment issue. It would have been perceived as a Second Amendment issue tied directly to, you know, again, the whole issue of the militia. I'm feeling a linear uh, storytelling impulse that I want to ask one more question before we come to the gentleman at the microphone. I know that gentleman at the microphone. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, the, the, so you'll indulge me, Bruce. Thank you. Is he a good is, guy? Is, yes. You know, we haven't. We, I don't want to skip over ratification. So I, I, maybe each of you could tell us about the, the ratification of the Bill of Rights, and what are the key things that we need to know about that? How whether it's about how contentious it was or wasn't, or were there key compromises or things that made it possible for certain states to get in line? You know, what, what are the things that you think are important to highlight about? Ratification. Or we could do the seriatim in sequence. <laughs> we could do anyway. 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 <laughs> okay, well, let's okay, mix so it up. Should we go in reverse order? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. It, we'll go. It in just order. wasn't important. Uh, I agree. It's no longer it's a bad an question. issue. Don't, don't no. Talk about it. No. <laughs> it's not a bad question. Uh, the state, that states were concerned about Overruled. the federal government <laughs> increasing its power. That the fight over <laughs> what constitution meant, what the elastic clause meant, the Ratification of the Bill of Rights was no longer an issue in the states. Okay. And ratification took its course over boring, the course of two years. Boring, boring, okay. Anybody else? Well, can I yeah, ask? No. Mary and Jack want to add I'll something. Add one though. trivia thing. So oh, no, in, the, in the 20th century, um, some states, like the state that I'm from now, Massachusetts, realized that they hadn't actually ratified all of the amendments. You know, they picked and chose. And so I think in the 1930s, um, when this oh, gets embarrassing, they go back and they sort of, they 
they ratified the ones they didn't ratify, you know, just to clean it all up real nice. They didn't uh -huh. ratify any of them. You know? They didn't, they, they, one house did, the other house didn't, yeah. and, and the federal government told them in 1939 that they hadn't ratified, and they were pissed. <laughs> uh, what do you mean we didn't ratify? At the we're, risk of putting Joe, Joe to sleep, Jack. Yeah. Uh, with this. We're in Massachusetts. <laughs> I, I, I think I would add one subsequent point. There was, I think, part we made earlier, but I would state it in somewhat different form. I, I do think that, you know, Madison was not an enthusiast for the Bill of Rights. He refers to it as the nauseous project of amendments. And <laughs> he, he didn't mean nauseous to himself. I think he meant nauseous <laughs> to <laughs> his colleagues no, in Congress. That's not where it comes he felt from. that, you know, the amendment that Joe mentioned earlier, the, the one that would have addressed the states and not the, Nash, and not the powers of Congress, he described that as the most valuable right. Uh, one in the whole list, and that ties in with this whole theory that the real danger to rights would arise not at the national level of politics, but within the state. So there's a number of complications there. But what I think is actually most important is that I, you know, I, think, I think Madison, first and foremost, had what was a truly brilliant theory about the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, he, he understands for powerful conceptual reasons that to make the Constitution supreme fundamental law, it has to be submitted to some overt expression of popular sovereignty. So that's why we had the state ratification conventions. But he and other federalists also insisted when the state ratification conventions act, they can really say only one of two words. They can say yes or I, no I, to the whole document. They want to propose amendments until the calls came home, they would be fine. But they couldn't make approval contingent upon the adoption of amendments. But when he moves, for reasons Mary and others have talked about, when he moves to accept that, and by late, by late 1788, I think at that point he had a more sophisticated political understanding that accords with this. I think he felt there were a lot of well-meaning but misguided anti-federalists out there. Madison did not think a Bill of Rights was really necessary. You know, it, it's okay. It won't do any harm. You want to be careful about how it's drafted and thinks a lot about that. But politically, I think what he wanted most was to say, if we want to kind of seal this whole process of approval, so the Americans had done remarkably. You know, I think we don't really understand what a great process the adoption of the Constitution was. I don't mean this, you know, because I'm wildly enthusiastic about every clause in the Constitution. But if you think if you think about how the Europeans mangled, you know, their constitutional treaty of 2003. I mean, the awkward process. The Americans. There's no precedent for what the Americans did. I mean, how do you ratify a national constitution through a course of popular discussion? Nobody had really solved that. They did it in 10 months unequivocally. And I think Madison saw the adoption of the Bill of Rights as an important kind of postscript. Well, postscript is too weak a term. An important conclusion of the process. There's a bunch of people out there, you know, they still have a lot of reservations about the Constitution. We want to assuage and, you know, try to conciliate them. So we'll get them some amendments. They'll be safe amendments. They're not going to deal with anything with the structure of the government. But I think it was kind of, you know, the, not a tuft of the whale, but an appropriate something to put in the wake that would help, see, I'll, see, I'll mix my metaphors terribly here, <laughs> so I ought to stop. But it would help to close the deal okay. in a really that, a, Quick a, thought, Ken, way. and then we'll get to Madison just, never okay. called Bill of Rights right. or the Amendments a nauseous project. What it's happened? It's in his letter. I know. Yeah. It's a letter <laughs> to Francis Hopkinson, yeah. who had sent him a poem called The Nauseous ah. Project about all the different states with their conflicting amendments. So he was, he was just appealing to Hopkins. Okay. This is why the ink never dries in your history books. <laughs> <laughs> this is, Joe, did you want to add something? Did, no, we, okay. we need to go to questions here. Okay, <laughs> okay so uh, when you ask your questions, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself. And then also, unlike me, I'm sorry, I, I modeled badly. Uh, ask a focus question, if when possible. <laughs> yes, Hi. sir. Hi, Hi Bruce. Bruce. Bruce Guthrie. Um, I should say first off that it took me a little while into to this to realize that bill of meant list of. I kept thinking some other type of bill. Um, I was a little confused. The freedom of religion, most of the discussion that we had of religion back then seemed to be different types of Protestant faiths. Uh, you know, we mentioned Quakers, we mentioned whatever. But as a country, my impression of early <coughs> America is we were virulently anti-Jewish, uh, fairly anti-Catholic. I have no idea what we thought of Muslims. When they discussed freedom of religion, did they explicitly include all religions, or were they mostly thinking of Protestants? Well, it depends. I mean, there are, two, there are really two answers here. I mean, um, 
first off, the question is, who's the they always needs to be qualified, but you know, putting that aside. So I think the two points I want to make is that it's important for us to understand that American ideas about religious freedom have a deeply radical Protestant point of origin. It's just a deeply embedded in the culture of colonial life. Jews and Catholics, to say the Americans were deeply anti-Catholic and deeply uh, anti-Jewish, I think that's a pretty problematic statement because there's so few of them. You know, there's some thousands of Catholics and some hundreds, you know, maybe a couple thousand Jews. They're happy <coughs> to just be able to worship on their own. Catholics don't care. They don't worry about parading the host in public streets. They're happy that they can have a place they can practice peacefully. So, you know, that's, you know, uh, I think that's, you know, I think that's, that's really the first big point to be made here. Um, Jefferson and Madison, you know, in some ways kind of following John Locke, and Locke was a major influence on these guys, were open to the idea that, you know, there should be a polyglot, poly, I don't want to say polytheistic, but that, you know, the United States should be open to people of other religious beliefs. Madison says as much in his memorial remonstrance against religious assessments, which is his, you know, not his first statement about religious freedom, but kind of the authoritative text that he drafted back in the mid-1780s in opposition to Patrick Henry's bill for a general assessment to support teachers of the Christian religion. And, you know, Madison says it very explicitly. You know, if, if, if we have two sectarian, we put two sectarian to cast on our policy here, we're going to discourage people who deserve to hear the message of Christ preached to them. So, he, I mean, that may have been a bit of ingenuity on his part. I'm not sure Madison was still a Christian at that point. It's one of the great mysteries about Madison. How do you date, you know, the depth and the extent of his religious belief at different points? But he, at least, you know, at least he opened up that possibility. I, I mean, I really think what Jack said five or ten minutes ago is the ultimate point. Yeah, if you look at, if you did a sort of demographic, geographic survey of, of American public opinion or popular opinion in 1789, something impossible to do, it would be predominantly Christian. Um, and with you know Anglicanism dominating in Virginia and Northern in some form of, pres of Presbyterianism or Congregation, all that, but that what they do in Virginia with the principle of religious toleration or religious freedom and in the First Amendment is a radical idea. It is still the single most important part of the Bill of Rights, and it translates perfectly. Religion is a personal thing. And the state yeah. cannot interfere with that process. Um, I mean, and that, that, and Washington goes to a uh, synagogue in Newport as part of his first trip to New England in order to, and gives a speech insisting that, yes, this does include Jewish people, in case it, you know, you're wondering about that. Um, I mean, it really is a statement that is so modern in its implications that it's difficult to understand how it, it, how it came to be at that moment. But it's the one that translates today more directly without having to go through elaborate uh, contextualizations um, more than any other. This is, I, just, I think this is such an important point because the Constitution itself said there was no religious test for office. It's not even in the amendments. It's Article 5. And there yeah. was almost, they, they all said at the time there was no disagreement about that. Trump's going to have trouble with that, yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> it's, I mean, it's in the main Constitution at a time when the state, many of the state constitutions had um, experience with tests for religious office. So it's an incredibly sort of radical moment in the actual Constitution. Yes, sir. Hi. Yes, good evening. Michael Maybach. I'm the member of the board of the John Jay Institute. Ah. Excellent program. Thank you so much. I was um, assuming we would hear a little bit about the New York ratification process because there was a fellow, unusual first name, I think his last name was Smith, uh, who was the head of the Anti Federalists. I thought between. What's his first name? Melanchthon Smith. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I thought between himself and, and Hamilton, there was a perhaps an informal deal that there would be a Bill of Rights, and that was part of the reason we got ratification in New York, but I'd like some clarification on that. Yeah. Well, Melanchthon Smith is a modern Anti-Federalist. The Federalists have a decided majority in the New York Convention. Excuse me, the Anti-Federalists had a decided majority in the New York Convention, and the Federalists are kind of waiting around to figure out you know, what they're going to do, and in the end, Smith carries a group of moderate Anti-Federalists with them, and you know, make I think New York ratifies 
30 to 27. But the only reason they ratify the is because it's already a done deal. I mean, in other words, well, nine states have ratified, and, Matt, and Hamilton's kept horses from Richmond to Poughkeepsie. They really just, Jay and Hamilton delay the debate in New York until ratification has happened in Virginia. It so happens New Hampshire actually precedes Virginia to be the ninth state, so that the debate in, in New York doesn't make any difference. Um, I hate to tell you that, but, um, <laughs> but I do think Jay is a more important guy. I discovered Jay in the most recent book uh -huh. I wrote is, is a more significant figure in American history than I'd ever imagined before. Yeah. So your, hmm. your job is safe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There's a, there, there's, oh, go ahead. Sure, there's, quickly. There's one more thing to be said about, because I suddenly have rib up. Smith and Madison wind up having somewhat similar positions. And I think Mary alluded to this earlier, on the merit of a Bill of Rights. It goes back to what I was trying to say at the very beginning. Why do you want to have a Bill of Rights? So we think of it as something you can litigate out. That's not the 18th century notion. Um, Madison, as Mary indicated, Madison says the way a Bill of Rights will work best if, is if you and I as individuals, in effect, inculcate its sentiments. If, it, if, if we understand that these rights are important and, and if we make the pursuit of those rights part of our identity as citizens, then that will mitigate what he might call our factious impulses. Smith does something similar. Smith also had, Smith was also the federal farmer. You know, as the well-known as the, the yeah, I mean, at least most historians now agree that Smith is the well-known anti-federalist writer, the federal farmer. Um, his argument for how a Bill of Rights will work, again, it's not about litigating it out. The idea is the people need a Bill of Rights as a collective entity. So they will know when government is overstepping its bounds. If you have a Bill of Rights, you will have a, you'll have a set of standards against which you can judge the improper acts of government. That's also an educational argument, but it's less, Madison's argument, I think, is more individualistic. Smith's argument has in a sense of more collective quality, but they're both thinking of it functioning, in a sense, in educative terms. Thank you. Hi, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Hunsaker. I teach at Catholic Theory and Law. Lots of James Madison, Thomas Jefferson there for me. Um, so I have a question on the Ninth Amendment. Namely, uh, there seem to be now two different positions on stage. One, that Madison is getting from Jefferson that the Bill of Rights is important in order to eventually instruct the way the judiciary is going to run. And then there's the point you just made, sir, about um, it being more individual exercise. But of course, the Ninth Amendment ends up fairly useless. It's non-justiciable. There's nothing the Supreme Court can do with it. What is the historical understanding of why the Ninth Amendment should be there, as Madison would see it, and maybe someone has an idea of how it develops over time? Because every time I brought it up in con law when I was in graduate school, it was, no, it doesn't matter anymore. When did it matter? Why is it there? It, it's Madison thinks it's the most important amendment. I mean, he thinks, he, he, he says that. This is the one that you really need. Because otherwise, people will think that these are the only rights that people have. I mean, he's very concerned about it. You know, why it gets read out of the Constitution, you know, why the judiciary over time reads all sorts of the Constitution out. You could write a book like parts of the Constitution that, that don't mean anything. When I studied for the bar, um, the Barbary people were like, the 14th Amendment, the Privileges and Immunities Clause is never the answer. And I was like, well, how can it never be the answer? And they're like, it's never the answer. And, I, and, and we were all like, well, what do you mean it's never the answer? And they're like, and plus, if everybody says it's never the answer, they throw the question out. <laughs> so you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question why, you know, somewhat similar to why we end up with our history where we don't amend the Constitution as much, why the Ninth Amendment maybe isn't um, as robust as, as I think people at the time might have imagined it. There's a, there's a wonderful, um, people have referred to 400 amendments. There's a, there's a wonderful um, Edward Dumble, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. Yeah, he, he did a lot of wonderful work early on on the Bill of Rights, and he had a list of all the rights that were listed. And he had 75 rights, of which only a few end up in the Bill of Rights, but if you look at all the state constitutions. And so the, the world had more rights at one time. Now, I don't know, maybe if somebody has a notion of why that vision vanishes. You know, it's a serious question. I mean, if go back to what I said at the very beginning. If you start to think about a right, not as a statement of a general principle that people ought to follow, but as a legally specific command, something some institution of government shall do, you understand how is it that a right stated as such 
becomes part of the constitutional text and therefore becomes part of the supreme fundamental law, then it really does matter which rights are included and which are not. And it also matters, and this is something that Madison worried about. So the question of enumeration matters. What happens to unenumerated rights? Where do they go? Are they off in some ether? And you know, if so, how do you bring them down? But the question also of how do you textualize a right, for which in some ways the Second Amendment has become the most absurd example, uh, also, also figures. A, a, you know, to think about what does it mean to have a right is not an easy subject. It's philosophically and legally, it's a very complicated matter. But if you want to put it into a written constitution, particularly the kind that Americans like, you know, short, at least at the national level, short and sweet and fairly elegant, the question of how do you frame the text is a serious question. Thank you for being a gentleman and deferring to the other mic. But <clears throat> now your turn. Thank you. Um, first, thank you very much to National Archives and all of you for putting on this very intellectually entertaining discussion. My name is just simply John Del Pino. And my question is to all of you what your opinions are on if you can talk about the origin of the phrase towards a more perfect union and its significant significance as an implicit philosophy behind the future elasticity of these documents. Thank you. Say the last part again. I'm sorry. The future I talk too fast sometimes. I, I was trying to just. I don't know Future. the historic, towards a more perfect union, the, the origin of that phrase historically in this discussion and its significance in the role of towards the future elasticity of these documents. Thank its you. role in the elasticity oh, of the document. All right. Governor Morris wrote those words and, uh, in August of 1787, and he was referring to the fact that they were replacing a less perfect union, <laughs> namely the Confederation, and I don't think he had, although Morris was one of the most outspoken critics of slavery in the debates uh, in Philadelphia, but I don't think he had anything like an understanding of that you're talking about in terms of expanding definition of the people. I mean, after all, what that, I mean, Jack, give me some numbers here, but if we the people. Come up with your own numbers. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Well, you're not a numbers guy. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, seven. Sorry. I mean, I'm trying, like, if in 1789, when it was ratified, <laughs> how many people were citizens that fit we the people? We the people, well, you had to be a male, you had to have property, and you had to be white, right? And the total population is three million. Three million. Three right. million. Okay. Well, wait, Joe. But this begs the question of how you define citizen, because the concept of citizenship can be linked to having uh, having a whole array of rights. The right to vote. You know. Right well, to vote. Okay. Okay. Right to vote. So, um, so you want to say for, for political purpose or to serve a Franchise. Yeah. 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 Right to vote. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you got to figure it's like two hundred thousand. <clears throat> That's it. Um, now, when we say we the people. We mean like 320 million. Um, and we intend that to mean, you know, everybody. Um, and so, I mean, what we, you know, it's much, um, what am I trying to say here? I think one of the problems we have in the 21st century is to, um, that there are certain segments of we the people that no longer share the values of other people. Ken? I wanted to say something about elasticity uh, and this whole thing about whether the Constitution is a living document or a static document. Uh, this Constitution that was replaced, the Articles of Confederation, was a static document. It was put together by that band of brothers in 1776 and 1777. That I like that band of brothers. We're going we're gonna to all agree forever, and if there's a need for an amendment, we'll have to have it be unanimous. So to amend the Articles, it had to be unanimous. There was also something, I believe, the second article. All powers not, dele not expressly delegated are reserved to the states. Does that sound familiar? Tenth Amendment, missing one word, expressly. So the Articles of Confederation was a very rigid, static document. And so the amendment process that gave us what we call the Bill of Rights uh, was designed to be difficult, but to provide the elasticity that was needed. Uh. And similarly, and most, one of the most important things, the Constitution does not say how many people will sit on the Supreme Court, how many Supreme Court justices uh. there will be. And that allows the 
Don't tell the Republicans executive, <laughs> executive and the legislature to change the size of the court when it gets too liberal or too conservative. It's been as high as 13, I think? 10. 10. 10. Um, and as low as five when it started. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Six. 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 Oh. Six. Six when it started. My name is One. Eddie Becker. And I was interested in having read through some of the uh, papers at that time uh, in the 1780s. Uh, it seemed as if Washington and his people were really uncertain about the future of the United States. There were people uh, who were rebelling against the central government. And the context of that has, having to do with paying back the, the debts from the American Revolution. And people were being taxed heavily and there was a groups all over the country who were rising up and putting, um, you know, basically having these assemblies and being repressed by another group who were trying to collect the money connected in with the banks. So in Massachusetts and in and Maine, what's now Maine, Shays Rebellion in 1787 uh, went to close down the courts and they were put down in a very heavy handed way. I mean, assemblies were prevented uh, people were thrown in jail without trial. Um, uh, guns were confiscated, and uh, people were put in jail. Then John Han Hancock. This, so from that comes a pushback, and 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 John Hancock comes in as, uh, as governor of Massachusetts. And from my understanding, it was said, you know, this idea of the Bill of Rights wasn't such a bad idea. So my question is, because based on how you've reconstructed this without this context of this great ferment that was going on and the uncertainty of the future. Um, why is there, I, I guess there's a paucity of documentation. I guess there's like, there's, there's not the evidence enough for you to be able to incorporate any of that history in your recollection of how things came. Because based on what I've heard. Well, well let's, let's find out. All right, well, based, out. Just, it just seems as if it's sort of like this uh, idea of the founding fathers uh, uh, sort of having this gift from the heavens. No, no, no. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, no. No, you should read some more. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, and the irony is that Shays' Rebellion is perceived by most of the uh, elites in Massachusetts and the rest of the country as the, the first sign of anarchy. And that it is because of that fear that the movement for a convention in Philadelphia uh, begins to have a level of credibility that it didn't have before. And so that the ironic implications of Shea's rebellion is to create precisely the kind of consolidated federal government that in some ways they are opposed to. Um, uh, but believe me, uh, historians have not been remiss in trying to connect the, the, these events you described with the the convention and the, the document and the Bill of Rights itself. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, the more specific way to think about this is that Shays' Rebellion leads directly to the Republican Guarantee Clause of the Constitution. And that's, that's a rights-based statement, if you think about it, but not in the conventional way that we think about the Bill of Rights. In effect, what it says is the people have a right to maintain a Republican form of government, and if that right is threatened by some kind of domestic uprising, and Madison has all these interesting speculations about the different ways in which an uprising can take place. Uh, the people have a right to be governed by Republican government, and if that's called into question because some kind of coup or whatever, uh, or the wrong kind of popular protest is afoot, then the national government should restore it. It's, you know, of course, the pro guarantee clause is a bit like the Ninth Amendment. You know, there's one or two cases, Luther versus Borden, Rhode Island is probably the only notable case on the subject. So it lies there as a tempting vessel into which no, nothing has ever been poured. Uh, I, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get going to go with you unit first, and then we'll come back over this way. These are the last two questions, by the way. We're just almost out of time. I'm Rebecca Brenner. I was a summer intern at the National Archives, now a volunteer. I'm a history PhD student at American and a former student of Professor Ellis. I was interested in, <laughs> I was interested in your discussion of the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause, and um, 
the, well, the free exercise clause to keep the government out of people's individual religions. And I was wondering to what extent the founders, especially Jefferson and Madison, wanted to keep people's religion out of the government. Or are they the yeah. same thing? Uh, Jeff, yeah. Well, it's a more complicated question. I mean, I think Madison's, I mean, Jefferson, I mean, I'm sure Joe will love this, but, or, you know, Gordon was lying that Jefferson was a virtual Pollyanna, so Jefferson had this high hope, as, as he says, I think, in the notes on the state of Virginia or something, you know, the future will all be Unitarians. <laughs> and that, that doesn't mean Unitarians doesn't mean the term today. It means, you know, we'll, Unitarian, we won't be Trinitarians, right? We won't believe in the Trinity. And so Jefferson hopes that Americans will become much more rational <laughs> in their religious beliefs, and he's deeply depressed in his later years because the Second Great Awakening pushes the culture in another direction. Madison, I think, was much more philosophical. And Madison says, look, people said when we moved towards disestablishment that, I was going to say all hell would break loose, but that it would lead to, you know, it would lead to lots of disorder and turmoil and collapse of morals, and that hasn't happened. You know, the churches have never been better than they've been since the different states have moved, have moved towards disestablishment. I think Madison's big hope was that um, essentially if you turn a bunch of Protestants loose with the Bible and no one's there to tell them which interpretation is authoritative, they'll find lots and lots of things to disagree about. And <laughs> on the whole, that's not a bad argument. The thing about it in the light of our current politics, it's worth asking, well, why is it therefore that the abortion issue you know, has become a real basis for unification among religious groups across a broad theological spectrum so that evangelical Christians, you know, truly Orthodox Catholics and Orthodox Jews, you know, who think would have really have nothing in common except their deep religiosity as it relates to this one point. But I think, so for Madison, the general theory is that, you know, Madison sees diversity of religious belief as the model of why having diverse interests will be, you know, really productive of, you know, of, of, of promoting liberty. But the religion question, in some ways, sometimes becomes too explosive, or some issues arise that allow, you know, allow strong sentiments to, to coalesce. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Juan Goldstrom, and I'd like to um, get more information about, or find out if there was any discussion on who would be excluded from the Bill of Rights. Like, we know that slaves, women, or, and how did they <laughs> reconcile uh, that? Can, can I just say, I think one interesting way to think about the rights that Madison suggests is which ones does he not put in? And so I've always thought it's interesting um, if you think of things that were in constitutions he was familiar with that don't end up. And both Massachusetts and Virginia had a clause that, in Massachusetts it's the free and equal clause, and in Virginia something like that, I can't quite remember. And in Massachusetts, the Virginians actually fight about it because they're worried if they put free and equal in their constitution, then how does that work with slavery? And they actually decide, like, well, no one will take it seriously, so it's sort of not a problem. And, and in Massachusetts, the free and equal clause is, is, then, is used in the 1780s to abolish slavery in a very famous case called Quack Walker. And so what's interesting in that regard is there is no language like that that Madison proposes. I mean, he doesn't propose anything that's expansive. And I personally believe, I don't know about you guys, but, um, but I believe the Just Compensation Clause in the Fifth Amendment um, is there primarily as a stop back that if the government of it gets around to abolishing slavery, white owners would have to be compensated for the losses, which is what the British ba basically do. And so in some ways, the amendments are narrow. And that's why, as Jack says, you sort of need the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, these much later amendments to open that part of the Constitution up. And I think this is in part because Madison was, um, was not the anti-slavery person that he sometimes is misunderstood as. He never freed anybody um, in who he held enslaved. And it was not, in my opinion, that good on this issue at all. OK, we are just about out of time, but about a minute for each of you. I'm going to circle back to the, the big our overarching, the theme of our, our gathering tonight, why the Bill of Rights was made. So I just want a final thought in, 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 on the big picture. I mean, we've dug deep on some of these questions, and you've made a lot of points. But I'm wondering if at any point here there's something you wanted to say or think is important in answering that question that we haven't touched on yet. We have a, about, about a minute for each of you. And Jack, can we begin with you? Well, I, I, you know, I say it's, you know, I think if you, if you think of the long-term sweep of American constitutional history, 
in the end, it's less important to know why the Bill of Rights was made because, you know, the, the development of legal enforcement or the Bill of Rights was strongly attenuated until, until after the First World War. So for a story, the real interesting story is how first, uh, how first in the realm of free speech and freedom of religion in the 19, late 19-teens, 1920s, 1930s, why you get the beginnings of the basis for the incorporation doctrine of the First Amendment, and then, of course, how that escalates as it did so radically under the Warren Court, particularly the criminal justice revolution. So I think you know, the, way, the best way to frame this is to say there's this interesting political story about the origins of the first 10 amendments, but you know, the real fruition is essentially a 20th century story that we're still arguing about because rights talk has become so central to our jurisprudence. Thanks, Joseph. It is, the Bill of Rights is, is the creation of a particular historical moment for reasons that don't have any transcendent value. We know that the Bill of Rights is going to have transcendent value, however. Um, it seems to me that the Bill of Rights represents an attempt to distill wisdom about, political wisdom about the last 30 years of American experience. And that that experience was itself looking back to the Glorious Revolution and the English Civil War. So that, and I'm arguing against you know, the original intent are people on the court who think that there was this moment when they had these piercing insights into the eternal truths and, you know, tongues of fire appeared over their heads. No, they are synthesizing the rights and the, 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 um, the values of their moment in time. Um, and, you know, it's like there's a joke, I think I saw it in the New Yorker, and there was a case before uh, uh, the Supreme Court, and Alito was... Uh, not Alito, um, uh, Scalia was uh, asking questions of this one guy. It had to do with the internet, and the guy didn't understand what the question was, and Alito said, um, oh, Justice Scalia just wants you to know what Madison thinks of uh, video <laughs> games. Um, um, and um, so <laughs> we've transformed it, in, in, but we are in our moment where we're going to discover different kind of meanings in them. Um, but that for their moment, they did about as well as any group of human beings in modern history has ever done in creating this document and this Bill of Rights. And we ought to, they're not saints, they're not canonized anything, but it's really unbelievable what they achieved. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm just going to say that I think one of the things that's amazing is that even though you can explain there are 12 and they weren't done this, all these, these things, nonetheless, we live in a culture where you can go everywhere in our culture and find bills of rights. And so I have a whole collection of these, like the Burger King Bill of Rights, the Pet Bill of Rights, the Hospitals Bill of Rights, right? the MBTAs. And what I love about them is they all, everybody puts the lettering squiggly, and the paper is yellow. And so there is this <laughs> cultural way in which this moment and the Bill of Rights coming out of this moment is such an important part of our, certainly, American cultural tradition of the rights. Okay. Can you get the final word? OK, well, I think it's important to realize that the iconic status of the Federal Bill of Rights is something that came out of the New Deal and the sesquicentennial commission mm. on the ratification of the Constitution and was an absolute direct response to the rise of Nazi Germany. If you read FDR's address on the 200th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights, December 15th, 1941, one week after Pearl Harbor, the address is all about Nazi Germany, one, one line about Japan, and not very much about the Bill of Rights except as, as an example of what Nazi Germany isn't. Thank you. Uh, a couple thoughts for you. Uh, one is thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. You'll come back to future archive uh, events. And, and the, the, my final thought is helping me thank this amazing panel. Uh, if you want to talk Constitution, you don't do much better than this. So please join me in thanking this spectacular panel. I'm going to see my friend clapping up there if he has his book. Thank you and good night.